Amen. All right, last week <clears throat> we technically began the Bible study on the book of Lamentations. We didn't uh, uh, begin with chapter number one yet, but we had the introduction to the book of Lamentations last week. We went over a few things, uh, which would be uh, the authorship. We spoke of the timing, uh, uh, the uh, content of the book, uh, you know, what it is about. And we also went over some of the themes that take place in the book. So just to do a, a quick introduction to the book of Lamentations right now and the sermon this evening, just to remind you, so the book of Lamentations is a book that was written time-wise post uh, invasion by Babylon into Jerusalem. So this would be post invasion. This is after the captivity. So there were three different times that uh, Babylon, and that is the empire of Babylon, who Nebuchadnezzar of course was the king, that Nebuchadnezzar uh, uh, ransacked or invaded the city. He besieged the city a few times and he actually broke into the city uh, three different times and he took away captives at that same time, he slew many people, he killed many people, he set things on fire, he destroyed many of the buildings, and uh, you know they, they, as is worded, tread underfoot, uh, or uh, it, it, the city was trodden underfoot is a very famous phrase. Uh, numerous different times uh, throughout this period uh, of, of, uh, the, uh, uh, of Babylon, the empire coming into Jer Jerusalem. Now, one thing that I want to mention, too, that I believe I, I alluded to, but I didn't emphasize this, and this is very important to the book of Lamentations. The book of Lamentations is very much a book of poetry. And as I said, I know that I alluded to it because when I brought it up, was when I was speaking about Jeremiah and how Jeremiah doesn't write much poetry in the book of Jeremiah. He does some. Now, you know, like I said about the authorship, it's possible that Jeremiah was the author. I'm not positive about that, but I just said that I felt as if there was insufficient evidence to come to a conclusion or to draw a hard line on this particular issue. Maybe I'm overlooking some information that reveals the author, uh, the identity of the author, uh, but f at this point I'm not exactly positive who the author is, and it may just be that we don't know, and, and that we're not going to be able to know, and that information is not given to us, and that's perfectly fine. There are things in the Bible that we aren't going to know, and I uh, went over that last week as well. So, so we're going to see a lot of poetry throughout the book of Lamentations. There are multiple uh, 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 metaphors that are used. There are multiple analogies that are used. And that is really going to walk us into chapter number 1. I'm going to quickly give to you the theme of chapter number 1. Chapter number 1 is about a woman. And this woman's name is Zion, is what she is referred to repeatedly. It's about a woman who is mourning and who is in uh, affliction and she is in sorrow and misery. And what she is mourning about, and this is the major theme right here in this particular statement, she is mourning because there is none to comfort her. That theme is brought up repeatedly throughout Lamentations chapter number 1. And so, as I said, we're going to see a lot of imagery. When we read through Lamentations number 1, it's going to be very poetic. There's going to be a lot of symbolism and there's going to be a lot of imagery. And then at the end, I want to give you some typology as well. So this, of course, is a considered a historical book. It recorded the uh, uh, prophecies that Jeremiah prophesied would come to pass uh, regarding the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, and let's begin with Lamentations chapter number 1, verse number 1. The Bible says, How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princes, princess, I'm sorry, and princess among the provinces. How is she become tributary? So here in verse number one, we did look at this in the introduction. We actually compared this unto the verses that are, that are uh, uh, very similar to it throughout the book of Lamentations. And it is the first verse in chapter number two. And then it is also the first verse in chapter number four that, are, that is very similar to verse number one here in chapter number one. He asked the question and it begins with the word how. How? And the question is obviously it's a rhetorical question. He's looking around and he's just wondering. He's in awe. He's in amazement on how this city that was of so greatness or of so much superiority at one point has now become tributaries, now paying taxes, is now in subjection to the, the uh, empire of Babylon. This city that was so high has now been brought low. And he's asking the question because he's in amazement, showing, you know, uh, what... Uh, 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 you know, a great standing or high standing that the city of Jerusalem had. Notice how it's worded. It says, 
she that was great among the nations and princess among the provinces. So notice that she had superiority over all the other provinces. She was, she was great among all the other nations. If you think about all of the, the, the dynasties, uh, the, the time of the dynasty of Israel and the particular periods of time where they truly did reign over many nations. And not only did they, they, they reign over uh, a lot of nations, but they actually did not choose to oppress many nations with their power, but they were just happened to be greater and richer and stronger than many nations as well. Especially when we look at uh, 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 Solomon's reign. And really that is the, uh, the, the you know, pivotal point Point of power in Israel's history when the temple is, is at its finest and greatest point and uh, of course all of the architecture and the things that were built during that time period. Uh, so then he asked the question, you know, how is she that is great among the nations and, and princess among the provinces, how has she become tributary? Obviously when you're paying taxes, you are the servant to the person that you are paying you know, the taxes to. That's the point. They, they used to be greater than, than them. They used to have a, a rule and dominion over these other nations, but now they are serving the other nations. And the proof of that is that they are paying taxes or they are tributary uh, or become tributary. So notice that she's referred to as a woman here. Also notice that she is referred to as a widow. And it says that she has become solitary. She has been destroyed. Look at verse number two. She weepeth sore in the night. So it's painting a picture of a woman that is sad, a woman that is full of sorrow and she is weeping or as we would say crying and she's crying throughout the night. This is a woman that's filled with deep sorrow. She's, she's losing sleep. She's staying up in the middle of the night and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, now watch this, she hath none to comfort her. Now that's going to be a theme. That particular statement comes up numerous times. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Now, uh, treacherous refers to betrayal. It's saying people that she was close to her friends, her lovers, have betrayed her. Right? They have dealt treacherously with her and now they have become her enemies. So she's been betrayed. She's been uh, 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 used, if you will. Look at verse number 3. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction. So who is this woman? We were just told. Judah is the woman that is being described. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwelleth among the heathen. So this is describing her being carried away into bondage and she's been taken into the land of the foreigners or the strangers, which is the land of the Chaldeans, Babylon. She dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. Something straight is something narrow. Oftentimes that's the, uh, uh, the point when someone will pounce. Because you can't go left, you can't go right, you can only go full steam ahead. Therefore you are able at that point, uh, if you're in a military battle, to just chip away at everyone in the back. And you'll talk about, you'll, you'll read about in the Bible sometimes of people being caught when they're in the straits. I believe Zedekiah actually, he was in the straits between the garden. And that's actually when they caught him. And that, that would be who he's referring to here. Because Zedekiah is Jeremiah chapter number 52. That's the last king that was taken into captivity in the last uh, besiegement of the uh, um, empire of Babylon. He says, All our persecutors overtook her between the straits. Verse number 4, The ways of Zion do mourn, because none come to the solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate, her priests sigh, her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Now, Judah is used interchangeably with Zion here. And notice that she's, again, weeping. What is she doing? She's mourning. That's the title of the book here, Lamentations. The whole book is about, uh, uh, you know, this woman lamenting, Jerusalem lamenting. Uh, it goes on, notice that it says, they are mourning. One of the reasons is because none come to the solemn feasts. So notice people have stopped serving the Lord. These feasts were obviously of God. They were uh, you know, ordained by God. They were divine and God wanted them to set these apart. They were solemn, serious, or you know, that, that uh, carries the meaning of, of something that is sanctified. But no one's going. All her gates are desolate. That's like how it said, it's solitary. The city is empty. People have been killed. People have died. They've been carried away captive. It says, and all her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. 
Her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Of course, sighing is a, it's an expression that we'll do uh, uh, you know, physically with, uh, uh, to express dissatisfaction or displeasure is what a person will do when they are bothered by something, when someone is depressed, when they are concerned about something. You know, uh, if, if something is on my mind and I'm driving and I'm thinking a lot, you know, I'll sigh. My wife will always ask me when I do that, you know, what are you thinking about? She does it all the time. It's like a running joke, you know, because I'm just consumed with thoughts all the time. And, and I'm driving, I'll just be like, <sighs> and she'll be like, what are you thinking about? She knows I'm thinking about something that's bothering me. She knows that I'm, my mind is consumed with something, you know, that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that, that I'm dissatisfied with or that I'm displeased with. That's why sighing is mentioned here. The priests sigh. Why? Because they're, it's a time of depression. It's a time of affliction. It's a time of sorrow. No one's coming to the solemn feast. No one's serving God. Her virgins are afflicted. And then it says, and she is in bitterness. Of course, Zion represents the city itself. It's saying that all the people are in bitterness. All the people are mourning. All the people are, are afflicted and they're weeping and they're sad. That is what this, this woman represents. Is she represents the, the, the citizens of Judah or the citizens of Jerusalem. Verse 5 says her adversaries, that's like an enemy, are the chief. Notice again how the tables are turned. It's saying that the adversary rules over her. Her enemies prosper, saying they're victorious over her. For the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Now notice it says for, meaning because. So notice that the reason why her enemies afflicted her was because the Lord afflicted her using her enemies. Her adversaries uh, uh, you know, were just a tool in the hand of the Lord to punish her for her affliction, or I'm sorry, for her sins or transgressions. And then it says her children are gone into captivity before the enemies. So that's one of the, the punishments. If you go to the, the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter number 32, you're going to read about some of the punishments that God promises that He will bring upon. Or it's Deuteronomy 28, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy 32 is on my mind because we're on the wine issue lately. But Deuteronomy 28, I believe it is, is where uh, the record is of, of all the, the, the prophecies that God warns the nation of Israel with when they make the covenant of what He will bring upon them if they disobey the covenant. If they disobey His commandments, and these are uh, all all of the, the judgments. Uh, he talks about the fact that they're going to be in famine. He talks about the fact there's going to be sicknesses. He talks about the fact that he will bring the, the enemies upon them. And they'll bring in, he'll bring in people that are swift as an eagle. You know how uh, the, the Babylonians and the Chaldeans were described? As being swift as an eagle. This is the judgment of God that he had warned them about. Also captivity was one of those uh, judgments. It says in verse 6, And from the daughter of Zion, all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that find no pasture and they are gone without strength before the pursuer. A heart is like a type of deer basically and it's saying that they've all scattered because they found no pasture. They're, they're searching for something to eat. That's what a deer is looking for and if they find no pasture they're going to move on. It's, it's referring back to again it being desolate or it being solitary, it being empty. And what does a heart do? They'll leave if there's nothing to eat there. That's what they're saying. There's no food. There's nothing there. They left. And then it says, uh, verse number 7, Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. So those are strong language used there. Miseries is a strong word. We sometimes, you know... Uh, abuse words and we use them too loosely. Like, oh, that's horrible, right? When we're talking about milk spilling. Or that's terrible when, you know, something small happens, you know, just something very little happens. You know, that, you know, your wife just barely overcooks, you know, the food. And you're like, that's terrible. No, I'm just kidding. So you'll have like these small little things, little, little mishaps happen and we'll use these words a little bit too strongly. Horrible, you know, terrible. But these are strong words, just like the word misery. Misery is, is, is uh, uh, just deep, deep pain and sorrow. That's what the word misery means. It's, it's very strong, severe sorrow. It's something that we, you would use to describe death. It's something that you would use to describe you know, the, uh, some of the worst you know, catastrophic events, catastrophic events that have taken place or maybe that you have encountered in your life. Misery is a word that you could probably only use to, to uh, uh, you know, label a few events that have, you have experienced in your life. It's a strong word and it says that 
The, in her days of her misery and affliction, she remembered her pleasant things. So in a time of trouble, she's sitting here and she's reflecting back upon how good things used to be. And that's what people will often do when they're in hard times. You sit there and you torment yourself with thoughts. You sit there and you think about things. And oftentimes, you know, when you're, you, you are in a hard time or you're, you're going through an issue, you, for whatever reason, you are your worst enemy and you sit there and you imagine and, uh, things that are, that are uh, uh, maybe possibly going to happen that are bad or you think thoughts that make you feel worse. And obviously, in a moment of distress and misery, uh, you would make yourself feel even worse if you started reflecting upon how good you used to have it. And this is oftentimes how people react when they're in times of tribulation and trial. That's why this is mentioned. Another thing that I talked about in the introduction that I want to bring up is that the book of Lamentations is extremely personal from the writer's perspective. It's, it's almost like, and I think this is a perfect way to describe it, it's almost like a diary that someone wrote in a poetic form and a poetic style that was looking around and just describing to you you know, how they felt and the things that they saw during, you know, this catastrophic and this, you know, this, uh, 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 this atrocity that had taken place. So it's a very, it's a very personal book and, and that's why you see a lot of emotion here. That's why you can see a lot of deep feelings and deep thoughts, you know, being pulled out from it looks like the writer's soul and put upon the paper. It says further, uh, um, when her people fell into the hand of the enemy, watch this, and none did help her. Notice again, no one comforting her, no one being there for her. The adversaries saw her and did mock at her Sabbaths. So not only are those that, that she loved and those that she leaned upon and cared for and was friends with not comforting her, but now she has people mocking her. So she's in the worst type of situation that she could possibly be in, Zion that is, and now her, her uh, adversaries, after she's just been, you know, uh, uh, used and abused in the most horrible way, she's being mocked and made fun of when she's as down and out as she could possibly be already. So it's just uh, pouring salt into a wound. Look at verse 8. Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. Now that's a key verse to help us understand why these events are happening. Notice, Jerusalem hath grievously sinned. So it's a deep, it's a very bad sin. That's why this is a grievous punishment. God is a just God. Therefore, so because of her sin, she is removed. That means that's why she's taken out. That's why the, cap the, uh, uh, the, the captives were taken into Babylon. All that honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, watch this, she sigheth and turneth backward. So notice that they look at her, they used to honor her, they despise her. It's painting a very clear picture here of what is taking place. You need to imagine and, and, and dwell upon these things. It says those that honored her despised her. It said because they have seen her nakedness. So they, they, the, the, they looked at her, they saw her nakedness, her shame. And then it says this, yea, she sigheth from her depression, her sadness, her dissatisfaction, her displeasure, and then it says she turns backward. So she sighs after they look at her, they're mocking her, they, they, they see her nakedness, she sighs, and then she just walks away. What's the picture that's being painted? She's depressed, she's down, and then she walks away what? Alone. That's the picture that's being painted. She's again by herself. She has no one there, and the only people that are there are mocking her and making her feel worse. It says, her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore, she came down wonderfully. That's referring to the fact when it says, she remembereth not her last end. It's, it's talking about the fact that she didn't know what was going to take place. And that's why it says, therefore, she came down wonderfully. They, it's saying that they came in and she was not prepared. And, and she was surprised. Therefore, the destruction was that, that much worse. It says, therefore she came down wonderfully. Now watch this again. She had no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. So now the, the woman cries out to God and says, look at my affliction. Feeling as if, of course, the, the Lord does not see her and he's not regarding her and he's not hearing her. So this is a, a call of disparity. 
calling upon the Lord in the name of the Lord. Verse 10, the adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things. For, yet, for he, she, I'm sorry, for she hath seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. Now we're not going to go to it, but if I were you, I would read sometime this week, and maybe a couple of times while we're going through the book of Lamentations, we will turn there at, at one point. Jeremiah chapter 50 through 52, which deals with when these events actually took place. So notice there that, that they, they took... That is uh, uh, the enemy, and that's Babylon, all of her pleasant things. This is referring to the things of gold. It's referring to specifically the vessels of gold, the vessels of silver, the fine, uh, uh, precious uh, uh, um, silvers and gold of vessel, uh, vessels, that is, that were in the temple and in the sanctuary. These were all in the temple and the sanctuary, and it says they reached forth and took the things... Uh, that were pleasant, it says, For she hath seen, notice for, because she hath seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary. So notice that the pleasant things are taking her out of the sanctuary. Well, one of the things that Jeremiah records at the, at the end of the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 50-52, through 52, is Babylon going in and removing and taking all of the vessels and carrying them away into Babylon. That's specifically what this is referring to. And it says, Whom, talking about the heathen, thou didst command that they should not enter into thy congregation. Of course, the, uh, the heathen is, uh, 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 is not permitted. They are not they are forbidden from entering into the congregation. Look at verse 11. All her people sigh. Again, the sighing. <sighs> they seek bread. They have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. See, like they said before, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. So they point out that they are giving their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. It's talking about being in a famine. They don't have just money that they can trade. They don't have... You know, things that they can give away. Now they're giving away things that are precious to them. Now they're giving away the things that were meant, you know, to be uh, 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 luxuries. These are their pleasant things. And why are they doing so? For bread. And it's to relieve the soul. So the word pleasant is like please, right? This is more so something, an item that would be for like entertainment. It's a pleasant thing, right? It's not something that's necessary. But they're to the point of disparity where they have to trade their pleasant things just for bread. And then it uses this word, to relieve the soul. It's referring to the fact that they are in a famine and they're desperate to where they have to start giving away you know, their things of entertainment, their things that they received joy out of, uh, just so they can relieve the soul. And then it says... See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by? So, notice the woman again spoke to the Lord and said, See, behold. Notice, there's, this is also a theme. Repeatedly, we're going to see it a few more times, the woman cries out to people. So, we have this picture of a woman standing by herself.